In the rugged northwest, an ancient Simsian alliance gave rise to a mighty dynasty who led their people through a time of change, chaos, and death. Conquer, surrender, victory, defeat. These deadly battles shape the continents. These are nations at war. Throughout human history, few forces have united fragmented peoples into mighty societies like a mutual threat. In the face of a powerful enemy or looming disaster, old grudges and rivalries become an obstacle to survival. New alliances are forged out of mutual hardship and mighty dynasties are born as both conflict and adversity offer opportunity. In the 1800s, war and turmoil across the Pacific Northwest gave rise to a line of mighty Simsian chiefs who used persuasion, might, and innovation to lead their people through the darkness and founded one of the most important communities in Canadian history. For decades, maps dubbed this place Port Simpson. In the 21st century, it is known by its ancient name, Lac Boulams. The story of Lac Boulams began long before its founding, when this pivotal place was merely a seasonal campsite, and the Simsian were one of many societies vying to control the Skeena River. Sharing a common origin with the Nishka and Gitsan, the Simsian have called the lands around the Skeena home for at least 10,000 years. Hereditary chiefs governed a society stratified into three classes, nobles, commoners, and slaves. The focal point of their lifestyle was the bounty of the sea. Along with staple foods like salmon, the Simsian also harvested fish known as ulican. Ulican oil was an important commodity traded for furs, copper, and meat with the First Nations deeper inland. Simsian traders then resold these goods to other coastal communities, along with slaves captured in battle. It was the grease that was valuable because the grease you could preserve and they would uh, trade that uh, well into the interior because the food was portable, it was uh, storable, and it was uh, really rich in protein. However, the Simsian's success and security were constantly tested by a powerful rival to the north, the Klingit. The Klingit could muster large numbers of armored warriors to plunder villages across the region while their control of trade along the Taku and Stikine rivers brought power and prestige to their chiefs. So the Tlingit and the Tsimshian became great rivals even before Europeans arrived. Both were in some sense competing for the monopoly of trade with the interior. These were pre-existing animosities. They were, they were rivalries that extended into antiquity. The Simsian and Klinkit relationship was complex, and the two societies enjoyed extended periods of peace and cooperation. These great, uh, if you like, trading but also warrior nations had a multiplicity of relationships with each other. These were also clan-based societies. Each of the cultures had parallel clans in the other cultures. And the clan system allowed them to, if you establish friendly relationships, intermarriages and peaceable relations. However, Simsian oral histories also record at least two invasions by desperate or ambitious clans of Klingit. The northern invaders were so successful against the divided Simsian that the Klingit gained control of the Skeena's mouth. Many were forced to flee inland to escape the violence. However, retreating to remote strongholds would not reclaim lost territory or discourage Klingit clans from seizing what remained. 
In these dark days over 1,500 years ago, nine different Simpsian groups banded together, forming an alliance that endures to this day. By standing together, the nine allied Simpsian halted the Klingit's expansion and steadily reclaimed their coastal territory, including the mouth of the Skeena. The end of this war established a permanent frontier between the two nations. Though the Klingit could raid coastal villages, the combined might of the nine allied Simpsian made any future invasions impossible. And as the generations passed, their union only grew stronger. By the 18th century, this ancient partnership put the Simpsian at the forefront of an economic and technological boom. It gave rise to a political dynasty that would lead their people through an age of chaos and conflict. In the 1700s, the west coast of North America was a hub of global trade and home to some of the oldest and most dynamic civilizations in the world. At the heart of this thriving network of nations were the Simpsian, one of the largest and most successful societies in the Northwest. The Simpsian established their influence through a combination of diplomacy and military might. Mastering these skills proved vitally important to the northern Simpsian, who banded together in the face of invasions from their neighbors. After a fierce conflict fought over 1,500 years ago, the Simpsian drove back the Klingon and regained the lands they had lost. In the fires of adversity, an alliance was forged by nine distinct Simpsian groups that endures to this day and set the stage for their descendants' rise to prominence. By the 18th century, the alliance controlled one of the most valuable pieces of Simpsian territory. They controlled access to the interior through the Skeena and through the Nass. Nobody could pass up and down those rivers without their permission. It's a place where people can easily access to any number of rivers that are flowing into it. By combining their efforts, the allied Simpsian exerted considerable influence in one of the most violently competitive regions on the continent. The Klingit remained potent rivals. While their cultural kin, the Nishka and Gitsan, could be partners one day and enemies the next. Across a narrow strip of the Pacific Ocean prowled even fiercer enemies. Two civilizations so feared as maritime marauders, they have been compared to the Vikings of medieval Europe. The Haida and the Kokwakiwaka. Their major thing that they were known for is their ability to uh, fight. They were good at it and, and trained extensively as young people. Their raiding fleets ravaged the Pacific coastline for generations. In some sense, uh, there was some prestige attached to uh, raiding, uh, successfully coming back. In pre-European times, it was traditional to take the head of the slain warriors. When you had, uh, killed somebody uh, in battle, you would bring their heads home with you and display them as trophies. By the 1780s, the combustible nature of diplomacy and trade in the Northwest benefited the newest players in this cutthroat world. Europeans. Many of the visitors were ambitious traders, eager to exploit the vast natural resources of the Pacific Northwest and willing to peddle guns and steel blades to powerful communities in exchange for furs. Simshans, like uh, the other Northwest Coast cultures, were curious about this. Once they saw the European muskets and guns, they wanted to acquire these for themselves. The introduction of uh, 
guns was just one more way that these people had an opportunity to, to fight with each other. By the 1820s, merchant vessels were followed by Russian colonists in nearby Alaska, and the mighty Hudson's Bay Company, which maintained a vast quasi-empire for the British crown under the guise of the fur trade. However, the HBC's expansion along the Skeena River faced a powerful obstacle. The Baymen built Fort Kilmars near Lake Babine, confident that they could secure the business of the local Wet'suwet'en and Dokef. However, the vast majority of these furs went to a Simsian chief called Blagaic. This name was a hereditary title borne by one of the most important indigenous political dynasties. Along with their control of the Skeena River trade route, strategic marriages and alliances allowed Legaic to steer trade in the Portland Canal and the Nass River. With this economic success came political influence among the nine allied Simsian, the Nishka and the Klingit who lived near the mouth of the Stikin River. The Gaic dynasty is known as one of the dominating um, families and communities in the northwest coast. He basically had a stranglehold over all of the valuable furs that were coming from the interior to the coast. Rather than rely solely on the HBC for access to European firearms and technology, the Legaic turned to their American competitors who paid a higher price for furs. Unable to lure Legaic's partners into their sphere of influence, the HBC tried to disrupt this trading network by establishing Fort Nass on Fishery Bay. But Legaic outmaneuvered the HBC yet again by offering the traders an alliance. At his insistence, the HBC abandoned Fort Nass in favor of a new outpost, Fort Simpson built on a campsite held by the Legaic dynasty called Black Wulams. Black Wulams would be a much more friendly and amenable place for the Hudson's Bay Company, of course, also better for Legaic and his family. In one fell swoop, Legaic had changed the HBC from a serious rival to the focal point of his expansive trading empire and protected his dynasty's influence over the region. But the price of this success was high. And to protect Black Lambs in an era of violent change, his successors would have to choose between a costly peace or a devastating war. Life in the Pacific Northwest had been fundamentally altered by the fur trade. For most communities, the European traders completely disrupted their traditional societies and economies in their relentless quest for lucrative animal pelts. And their introduction of firearms and disease proved utterly devastating, intensifying the frequency and cost of raiding exponentially. However, one dynasty of Simsian chiefs named Legaic managed to largely protect their people and embrace change in a way that benefited them. Through stunning diplomatic skill, the first Legaic created a trading network that reached from Haida Gwaii to Vancouver Island, forging unexpected partnerships with old rivals like the Klingon and Haida. Though these nations had raided each other for generations, Simpson control of the HBC outpost Fort Simpson meant peace was far more profitable for all three. At the center of it all was Lac Willams. Once a sleepy campsite, it was now the capital of the nine allied Simpson, a bustling boomtown home to over 2,000 indigenous people and a growing number of Europeans. It became a trading entrepot for the Haida, for the Tlingit, for the Simshan, who would uh, travel in some cases hundreds of miles uh, by canoe, uh, upriver, downriver, or across the ocean. It really was an intercultural community. 
The HBC traders were well aware that Fort Simpson's success was dependent on their partnership with the Simpson. But the Baymen were playing their own long game and becoming the focal point of the Simpson economy secured their position in the Northwest. The HBC had a very important role in the colonization of British Columbia. Much of the modern day cities and towns that we see on the map began as Hudson's Bay Company forts. The first brigade, whose connections and charisma created a measure of peace in a chaotic time, died in 1840. The Legaic chiefs who succeeded him struggled to uphold their namesake's legacy. After years of prosperity, Black Willams faced a looming economic crisis. As their vital position in the Western fur trade was steadily usurped by a rival British community to their south, the British called it Victoria. Founded as an outpost of the HBC, it soon became the capital of the empire's first real colony in the Pacific Northwest, Vancouver Island. People all the way up and down the coast would travel uh, by canoe all the way down to Victoria. It widens the number of forts in the presence of the Hudson Bay Company in the region. Victoria became a gateway through which a growing number of settlers, missionaries, prospectors, and adventure seekers arrived in present-day British Columbia. With them came disease, alcohol, and the Royal Navy. By the 1850s, the First Nations of the Pacific Northwest were in a state of crisis. However, the Simpson had always managed to adapt to this rapidly changing world, mingling British goods and ideas with ancient ways on their terms. One of the really interesting things about the Simpson culture is they actually loved innovation. And when Europeans arrived, they were actually very, very quick to adopt elements of European culture that they found attractive. In 1857, the reigning Legaic chief, known as Paul Legaic, attempted to do the same with Christianity. The chief invited the Methodist preacher, William Duncan, into his community, believing he could use the cleric to outmaneuver his political rivals. But the missionary was impossible to control. Their relationship soured so badly that the chief threatened to kill Duncan. In 1862, Duncan and several hundred converts left Black Willams and established themselves at the village of Metlakatla. This decision would largely spare them from one of the worst disasters in North American history. In the spring of 1862, a smallpox epidemic raging in San Francisco was spread to Victoria. Colonial officials failed to effectively quarantine Victoria or vaccinate its people, allowing the disease to spread to a nearby camp full of First Nations seasonal workers. Either out of fear of an outbreak or a deliberate attempt at germ warfare, colonial officials cleared the camp and towed canoes full of infected people back to their home communities, where smallpox spread like wildfire. 30,000 people, roughly two-thirds of the Northwest's indigenous population, died in just over one year. Smallpox epidemic of 1862 was devastating for uh, Native people on the West Coast. It spread um, throughout the coast uh, very rapidly. I know our people uh, were affected uh, during those years. Massive depopulation. Over the course of a century, Simshan population fell by 90%, perhaps even 95%. Metlakatla was among the few communities to effectively quarantine themselves and avoided the worst of the outbreak. William Duncan shamelessly credited this result to a miracle as opposed to his basic precautions and used it to lure more people to his church. Among them was Paul Legaic. When the crisis finally passed, the First Nations of the West Coast faced a harsh new reality. With so many villages destroyed or depopulated, foreigners steadily usurped huge swaths of indigenous land without treaties. 
The sheer loss of life made armed resistance to this influx of settlers suicidal, as any attacks on British colonists would only incur the wrath of the Royal Navy. Had we had the population um, that our ancestors before had, it would have made it extremely difficult for those people to take up tracts of land um, throughout our territories. With so many dead or traumatized, Simsian leaders like Paul Legaic did the only thing they could to protect their people. They kept the peace with the British. When Paul Legaic died, with him went most of his dynasty's political power and influence. However, his pragmatic decisions secured his dynasty's legacy. The village of Lakwalams endured along with the ancient alliance it represents. Even as the British and Canadian governments attempted to erase First Nations culture and sovereignty, the community remained a hub for indigenous thinkers, entrepreneurs, and activists. A shining beacon of hope in the dark times that lay ahead.